So this evening, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm pleased to welcome Laura Eldridge for a discussion of her new book, In Our Control, The Complete Guide to Contraceptive Choices for Women. In this new authoritative guide, Laura Eldridge explores the panoply of birth control methods alongside an analysis of the political, historical, and cultural context in their use in the 21st century. Eldridge reevaluates the pill in the light of its recent 50 year anniversary and also presents issues of environmental concerns to international laws surrounding birth control. In Our Control successfully seeks to encourage women and men to broaden the conversation around contraceptive use. The Feminist Review calls the book straightforward, non judgmental, and honest. And Elizabeth Kissing and a Miss Magazine blog review has this to say of Eldridge's book. Quote, this is women's health activism at its best. Feminism isn't just about choices, it's about having access to information and resources to make informed, authentic choices. And that is only possible when reliable and comprehensive information is widely available. And such is Miss Eldridge's book. Laura Eldridge is a women's health writer and activist. She began working with the founder of the women's health movement, Barbara Seaman, when she was studying at Barnard College. Alongside In Our Control, Ms. Eldridge is also the author of The No-Nonsense Guide to Menopause and the co-editor of Body Politic, Dispatches from the Women's Health Revolution. We're so thrilled that Laura's here with us in Cambridge, and thank you all so much for being here with us. Please join me now in welcoming Laura Eldridge. All right, thank you so much. It's, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here and to be back in Cambridge uh, where my brother lives, um, so I've had the privilege of being here a few times. Um, so I want to first start by talking a little bit about how I came to write this book. Uh, the, there are really two answers to that question of why I decided to write the book. Um, the actual idea for the project emerged in March of 2008. Uh, in February, less than a month before, my friend, mentor, boss, and eventually co-author, Barbara Seaman, had passed away suddenly uh, after a very short battle with lung cancer, but a very long battle uh, for women's health. Um, Barbara uh, was tireless and funny and courageous, and she had sort of been a warrior for women's health for many decades. Um, in 1969, she was a young journalist writing for Bride Magazine, Ladies Home Journal, and a couple of other women's magazines. She began receiving letters, as you do, from readers, and a number of these letters disturbed her. Um, Many of them had to do uh, with using the birth control pill, which at that point was still a relatively new thing in American life. Um, after a few years of this, of sort of hearing stories, uh, talking to doctors, uh, writing on the subject, Barbara decided she needed to do something to raise awareness about some of the health concerns associated with the pill, which of course at that point was a very different drug than the one that we have today. Um, what Barbara did, the thing that turned her into a full-fledged activist, was to write a book uh, that was published in 1969 called The Doctor's Case Against the Pill. Um, Barbara's book prompted congressional hearings sponsored by a senator named Gaylord Nelson. At that time, the second wave women's movement was sort of just gaining steam, and there were a lot of grassroots women's organizations cropping up all over the country, and one of those groups was DC Women's Liberation, uh, which was a group that was sort of headed up by a young woman named Alice Wolfson, who came up uh, in the anti-war and the civil rights movement and had been trained in activist strategies. And had done, the group had done a lot of activism around the DC area. They decided to attend the pill hearings, not intending to stage any kind of activism, but rather just intending to kind of gather information. Um, when they got there and they started listening to doctors and scientists testify, they realized that no patients, no women, in fact, were, were being allowed to take the stand. Barbara Seaman herself, who helped Senator Nelson design the hearings, was not taking the stand. And they started to get angrier and angrier. And they started to shout out questions, such as, why are women being used as guinea pigs? And why is there no pill for men? These two, uh, it, well, I should say, and at that point, of course, they were encouraged to leave the hearing room. <laughs> Um, but they caught the, the attention of the media and they made the national news and it brought a real awareness uh, around the country to the issues that were being discussed at that point. These two important, different and connected pieces of health activism, Barbara's book and Alice Wolfson and the DC Women's Liberation protests became essential and foundational pieces of the women's health movement. And eventually these two women actually went on with other women to found the National Women's Health Network and sort of broaden out the work they were doing with the pill to so many other uh, women's health issues. Being critical of the pill at that moment was a very complicated thing. 
The second wave women's movement was just getting going, just gaining momentum. The pill was a new thing in American life. And many people, and indeed many feminists, felt that to be critical of it was a bad thing for women because it, it gave strength to the voices of those arguing more broadly against contraceptive access. And it's easy today to understand those anxieties. Uh, right now, we face challenges to contraceptive access on so many fronts, from abstinence-only education policies to efforts to reduce funding for contraception under Medicaid uh, in Title X clinics and on college campuses, to so-called conscience clauses that make it easier for providers to refuse services, um, and of course, institutional problems. And we'll talk more about that later, but what happened at FDA with bringing Plan B over the counter. Um, and in light of so many challenges, it can be very easy to say, let's not worry about this stuff. You know, let's focus on the main event, worry about these other things. Um, Barbara, Alice Wolfson, and many others understood that ensuring that contraception was, was safe was as, as important as ensuring that it was, it was available. When Barbara was writing about the birth control pill, she was writing about a dangerous drug. Today, when I write about the pill, I have the privilege of writing critically about a drug that, while not perfect, is safe. Um, this change didn't happen because Barbara and Alice Wolfson kept their mouth shut or because countless women were too afraid of losing contraceptive access to speak up and share their experiences. The change happened specifically because of a healthy, thriving culture of, of feminism that was both publicly and privately in conversation about the pill and other contraceptive methods. Um, I worked with Barbara for about nine years. She was my boss, she was my coworker, and she was my friend. And when I lost her, it was two years before the 50th anniversary of the birth control pill and one year before the 40th anniversary of her landmark book. Before her death, she had been talking to Dan Simon at Seven Stories Press about updating Doctor's Case Against the Pill, sort of looking at the issues that are hot today and saying what's going on right now. Um, after her passing, I was meeting with Teresa Knoll, our editor on an anthology that we were doing for Seven Stories Press. We got to talking about Doc's case, about Barbara's legacy, and about, eventually, our own contraceptive frustrations. We discussed the idea of redoing or updating Doc's case, but at the end of the conversation, we decided that the best way to honor her memory was to do an entirely new book. Our goal in this book was in part to recenter the contraceptive conversation, which we felt had narrowed down sort of restrictively to the pill and condoms. Um, and we thought, why not take the anniversary of the pill as a moment to look at the pill today, to say what is the same, what has changed, and then to move outward and to look at everything that's out there, contraceptively speaking. So the other reason I wanted to do the book was more personal. Um, I myself was on the pill for about 10 years. Uh, I broke up with the pill when I was 27. Um, I first went on the pill when I was 18. Uh, like so many young people, I was going off to, I had been in a relationship for a while and was thinking about having sex and I was going off to college and I didn't want to take any chances. Being a young person at that point, I didn't walk up to my doctor and say, can I have a prescription, although I probably could have. I could have, you know, said that I wanted it for my skin or for any number of other things, but instead I did what all kids in Salt Lake City at that point who wanted birth control did. I went to the small Planned Parenthood about two blocks from my small Catholic high school. Um, and I knew this was the thing to do because this was the thing that girls talked about in the cafeteria over french fries and sort of, we knew that this was the smart thing to do. Um, kids went there because it was cheap, because it em employed the don't ask, don't tell policy, and I knew people who went for all kinds of services, including uh, things, concern for basic health, things like pap smears and, and things they were too embarrassed to ask their doctor for in other contexts. Um, the first time I went on the pill, not much happened. I would go on and off the drug for the next 10 years, um, each time experiencing more side effects when I did. Um, in 1999, I met Barbara Seaman as part of an internship for a women's studies class. I fancied myself a serious feminist, and I jumped at the trance to work with an author who a friend had explained to me had been an active member of the second wave women's movement. Um, you can imagine my surprise when on my first day of work, uh, I came to understand what Doctor's Case Against the Pill was about. Um, and I was about to learn that while, and there's no, there is no denying that the pill has revolutionized um, American women's lives and, and indeed the lives of women around the world, um, that this is a long story and it's a complicated story and it's one that's, that's worth getting into and learning. Um, so 
Even as I continued to work with Barbara, I stayed on the pill. The last time I went on the pill, I was 24, and things that had been small problems in the past became big problems. I started to have really crazy mood swings, so my doctor changed my pill. I continued having mood swings, but then started having breakthrough bleeding. My doctor changed my pill. This continued uh, with different symptoms over time, and eventually I ended up trying five different brands, and if you count the generic as um, a, a unique brand, then six different brands. Um, a lot of people have said to me, you know, you worked with Barbara Seaman, you were going to decide that you didn't like the pill. Um, I don't think a person tries six different brands because they don't want it to be the right thing for them. I really did. Um, and I wish that it had been. Um, my, my, so my last straw finally came um, <laughs> when I stopped having a period entirely. And a lot of people might like that, but I didn't. I found it very stressful. I worried that I was pregnant all the time. Um, and I finally went into my doctor and I said, enough is enough. I want to try something else. Um, let me say from the beginning, I don't share my own story to scare women off the pill. I, that is not at all my goal. I believe, in fact, that most women who take the pill, the majority of women, have little to no side effects and have good experiences. And I would never tell a friend who's happy on the pill to get off of it. Um, our birth control choices are private, and we as individuals dictate the factors, safety, efficacy, expense, ease of use, degree of sexual interference, and so on, that are important to each of us. Um, when it comes to contraception and to sexual health, health, there is no magic bullet. There's nothing that works equally well for everyone, but this is not the cultural message that we receive. To be informed consumers, to truly exercise our freedom of choice, we must sort of trust ourselves, and to build that trust, we have to understand how our birth control works in and on our bodies, to research all the options that are available, and to take into account the complicated, sometimes difficult history of how different birth controls came to exist as they do today. When women fought for the right to legally use birth control in the 20th century, they saw contraceptive access as the answer to women's social problems. Second wave feminists made the right to abortion and birth control central goals of their activism. And this is why many feminists in the 1970s didn't want to hear that the birth control pill was unsafe, because it meant facing was a really difficult truth, that simply accessing the drug was not something that enhanced women's power. Um, of course, at this point, after so many decades of experience, um, We've learned that gaining reproductive rights is not a simple answer to the bigger issues of reproductive justice and, of course, health justice for all women and all people. Um, in American history, reproduction has always been a place where racial inequality has been institutionalized, where the control of women by men has been constantly reaffirmed, and where middle class and wealthy women have been valued over poor women. Putting women in control of reproduction means addressing many social issues. Building reproductive freedom, including the ability to make contraceptive decisions, means giving women, not the many cultural forces around them and people in positions of power around them, the ultimate right to make choices about pregnancy. Limiting contraceptive knowledge is as dangerous a form of coercion as preventing physical access to methods. Uh, young women today sit at the epicenter of many cultural battles, and their access to knowledge about their birth control options is often foreclosed by those arguing that abstinence, not having sex, is the only valid way of uh, preventing pregnancy for young adults. Programs insisting on abstinence-only education have been gaining huge amounts of political and financial support for close to three decades in the United States and abroad. Besides seeking to prevent young people from becoming educated about contraceptive health, these programs promote religious values in public schools, decline to address the needs of students with diverse sexual identities, and insist on dangerous essentialist ideas about women and gender. Simply put, they instruct young people that gender is destiny. In addition, laws and policies that insist on parental consent to obtain certain types of health care and threaten to limit confidentiality for young women uh, violate the rights of young women and create a dangerous double standard. Women, even young women, should be given respect and knowledge and resources to make their own decisions. Women in the 21st century have the best birth control in history. They can use methods that promise to work more than 99% of the time. And yet, since the hormonal innovations of the 1950s and 60s, little has changed on the contraceptive landscape. And I'll speak a little bit later about some of the alternative distribution methods, things like the patch and the ring that in some ways are, are new, but in other ways are sort of really building on the technology uh, that came earlier. In many ways, female consumers can't win when it comes to birth control innovation. Um, 
If we insist on safety, it discourages pharmaceutical firms from advancing new and potentially dangerous methods, and then you know they're worried about lawsuits. If we embrace innovation, it often means taking big safety risks and accepting that we may not get all the information from companies with financial stake in promoting potentially lucrative new products. Um, understanding the ways that protecting com consumer safety has related to birth control innovation um, is an important step in asking the question of why, after half a century uh, and countless scientific advances, there aren't really any truly new methods of pregnancy prevention um, really, I mean, on the level of the pill, since the pill. Um, the obvious gender inequities within birth control are also really important to explore. Why is it that other than condoms, vasectomy, and pulling out, all methods of contraception involve women's bodies? Um, in what ways has scientific innovation uh, or sexism in medicine prevented the development of male options, and to what extent do women fail to involve male partners in these choices? There are no easy answers to this question. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a minute. Um, it's a really, really complicated question. Looking at birth control through these many lenses isn't easy. It means asking questions that often breed more questions. And I've been learning this firsthand, uh, traveling with this book in the past month. Um, my perspective on some of these things continues to, to shift as I have conversations with women about their experience, as I talk to doctors along the way who say, oh, I worked on this topic. This is tough stuff. Um, so I want to uh, briefly talk about some of the content in the chapters. Um, again, with the caveat that each one of these issues is really complicated, and I can't do it justice. But um, if I leave anything out, ask me about it. <laughs> um, so of course, uh, this is the 50th anniversary of the pill. So the past few weeks, it's been very difficult to open up a newspaper without seeing a story talking about the pill. Uh, the pill was the brainchild of Margaret Sanger. Uh, Sanger uh, was um, sort of the, the such a, a very complicated figure for women. She's at one time the heroine of the women's health movement, who sort of, or not the women's health movement, of, of the birth control movement, who basically re-legalized birth control um, after the Comstock laws and brought a social acceptability to it with a speed that probably wouldn't have happened without her tireless crusading. She also is somebody who, by the end of her career, had started to invest, or at least uh, give lip service to, many really disturbing eugenicist kind of ideas. Anytime you look at Sanger, there's no simple answer. She's a really difficult figure. Um, Sanger was dreaming of the birth control pill, even back when she was opening her first illegal clinics in Brooklyn, New York. Um, it would be many decades before she would be able to see it go any further. It happened uh, when she met two people who she was able to bring together at an advantageous moment. One of those people was Gregory Pincus. Pincus, uh, I think, I believe, had been here at Harvard, um, had done some really revolutionary work uh, with a rabbit embryos, stuff that was really ahead of its time. And he was characterized as a mad scientist. He lost his teaching position and opened up an independent lab uh, in Massachusetts. Um, so here she had a man who she believed had the, the scientific know-how to make this happen. Around the same time, an old friend of hers, a woman named Catherine Dexter McCormick, approached her about getting into the birth control business. McCormick was the wife of uh, a schizophrenic, and she had nursed him for many years and had put most of his considerable fortune into research on schizophrenia. When he died, she decided to redirect those funds to things that were, more, that were closer to her own heart namely birth control. Sanger had been hoping to get a hold of some of McCormick's money for a long time. So when it happened, she said, all right, Gregory, Catherine, and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> um, the pill was always a product that was a, a women's product as well as a men's product. I think there was a line at one point that said, you know, the pill was a male product imposed on female bodies. But of course, I think a really brief look at this shows that that's not true. There was, of course, Sanger and, and McCormick, but there were also women in Pincus's labs in Massachusetts. There was Idris Rice Ray and other uh, female physicians and doctors uh, in Puerto Rico conducting the early trials. So this was always something that women were a part of making. Um, when I went to write on the pill, I went back to Barbara Seaman's uh, 1969 book. Again, the pill today, or the pills today, because of course there are so many different kinds of pills, um, but most fall into the category of you know being a combined oral contraceptive, which is estrogen and progestin, or a progestin-only pill, which is newer and is something we're still continuing to learn about. Um, but these are pills that have about a tenth of the hormones that the original 1969, or sorry, 1960 and Ovid had. So that's a big difference. 
Um, there are a lot of good news on the pill. Um, I think the most the most prominent of which is the good news about ovarian cancer and the fact that using the pill lowers the risk for that that illness. Um, when it comes to side effects, I think they can be divided into two categories. There's there's life, sort of. Uh, potentially life-ending and life-disrupting. Life-ending is something that really doesn't happen much anymore. This is a very, very rare outcome. This is the kind of thing that Barbara first became tremendously concerned about when she started getting letters saying, I had a blood clot, I had a pulmonary embolism. These things don't happen much anymore. Um, they do still happen. I had a, a childhood friend who had a stroke, um, and her parents were very surprised when her Columbia trained neurosurgeon told them that they that he believed that it was in part because of her pill use. But this, for most women, unless you have a history of blood clotting or um, some sort of pre-existing cardiovascular risk factor, a family history that concerns you, this is not something that bears on your decision to take or not take the pill today because this is so, so very rare. Um, when it comes to life disrupting, and here I'm talking about things like changes in mood, uh, changes in, in libido and sexuality, metabolic changes, things like that. Um, this is where uh, you get into things that women very frequently and have for many years very frequently voiced that they believe there are connections between changes in their body and taking the pill. There's not consistent clinical evidence in a lot of cases to, to back that up. Um, I've now spoken to hundreds of women um, over the course of this process, maybe more, people sharing their stories. and. I believe that there are groups of women who experience these things. As I said, the majority, you know, do very well. But I do believe there are groups of women who have these struggles. Um, why wouldn't it be something that shows up in a clinical setting, I think is an interesting question. I spoke to a doctor and scientist in England named Cynthia Graham. And she's been working for many years on sexuality in the pill. And she said she outlined a number of sort of structural problems with a lot of the, the better trials uh, looking for these things. For example, like she said, a lot of them were performed on long-term pill users. So uh, it was sort of self-selecting to begin with. Women who had had trouble on the pill and gotten off were never included in the, in the trials to begin with. And she outlined a number of things like that. Um, what Cynthia Graham's trying to do, and I think this is the way that we need to think, is to say, how can we test this differently, design studies differently, so that we can try to plan for which the group of women, the smaller group of women, who may be more vulnerable to these problems and use that information to make the pill better, to make patient information better, and to sort of put this thing in the service of women. So I think that's absolutely the right way. Rather than saying, you know, this is good, this is bad, there's so much that's polemical out there, rather to say, how can we take what we have which is good and make it better? Um, alternative distribution methods, so when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about the patch, the shot, an implant, a uh, vaginal ring, um, even uh, the IUS, which is a type of IUD that has a hormonal component, Mirena. Um, it can be very easy to feel that birth control has changed totally in the past 10 years because every year there's a new one of these devices. And of course, it's valuable to realize that um, these things are all hormonal birth control. Um, they use the same technologies that were developed in, you know, in the early to mid part of the 20th century. Um, now, of course, they do have unique benefits and they do have unique risks. Um, in terms of benefits, of course, I've talked to many young women who like, you know, that some of these methods can, you don't have to think about them every day in most cases. It's something that you only have to think about once a week or once a month or every two months, depending, or with the IUS, once every 10 years, depending which method you select. Um, so it has a lot of advantages. That way, I spoke to one woman who shared uh, her story of taking the pill and having three unplanned pregnancies and switching to the ring and having that be something that was able to make a change because she just couldn't remember to take it regularly. These things also have unique risks. Um, and those, of course, because these things are newer, continue to emerge. And we'll see only with time and experience what they are and why, why they exist. Um, the earliest alternative distribution methods were Norplan and Depo-Provera. Uh, Depo was actually developed first in the 1960s by a Brazilian doctor who, I'll speak again in a minute, Dr. Coutinho, who wrote a book called Is Menstruation Obsolete? Um, but Norplan was the first to hit the American market. Within a week of hitting the American market, the Philadelphia Inquirer published an article claiming that Norplan maybe was the solution to poverty. And then it went a step further and said, maybe it's the solution to black poverty. It became very clear that a very disturbing history that we have in the United States 
of trying to uh, use birth control in coercive ways in communities of low income women and low income women of color was not past us. In addition to the very understandable outrage that surrounded the Philadelphia Inquirer article, um, there were also a lot of legislators who went home and started drafting proposals to try to use Norplant in coercive ways, for example, to make it a condition of receiving welfare benefits, having it inserted. Um, this sort of thing went on in less official ways. It went on in ways where uh, doctors were trained how to put the devices in, but not how to take them out. Or programs were created to make it cheap to get it put in, but not to provide financial resources for having it removed. Um, None of, the, none of the programs, uh, the, the legal programs, went into place mostly because of really fantastic activism on the part of women's health advocates. Um, but it was a cautionary tale. So this coupled with uh, bad safety information that started coming back about pain on site, other kinds of problems, led to the swift pulling of Norplant from the market. Now, I didn't think, I didn't think at the time, and I don't think now, that Norplant was a great, a great device. But at the same time, I think when something gets pulled and there are fewer choices, that women are sort of the ones who lose. I think the better thing, and, the Nor and I think Norplan is an example of how things could have gone differently. What could have been different if they had taken the time to get proper safety studies, if they had dealt with some of the, some of the uh, political stuff surrounding the drug, um, if they had made sure, for example, that doctors were better trained, this could have been a different story. But instead, it became a cautionary tale, and it sent drug makers running even faster away from contraceptive R&D, um, which they have always been tentative about in the first place. Um, today, much uh, more prominent are things like the, the ring, um, which I heard from a lot of young women that they like. The patch and the ring are sort of a story that go together. The patch hit the market. It had its moment in the sun with the media. Um, and then very quickly, stories about blood clots started arising. Studies were performed. There were two, two slightly larger ones, one funded in part by the drug maker. Um, the study that was not funded by the drug maker concluded that there were more blood clots, and the one funded by the maker concluded that there were not. They updated that study a few years later to say, yes, yes, there were. There were more. Um, the ring has similar anecdotal reports of blood clotting, um, but doesn't have the, the trials behind it. So it remains something where that's, it's more anecdotal than something that's been shown. Um, the question then, I guess, becomes with these devices, which, as I said, obviously have a lot of benefits for a lot of women. And as I've also said, I'm not in favor of just you know, being too quick to just pull something. But um, so with these two things, why might there be more blood clots? Um, Part of this might have to do with the way that the hormones is taken into the body. For example, the thought with the patch was that actually it would make hormone exposure lower, but in fact it was higher. So it didn't work exactly the way that people who made it expected. Um, or it could be the type of progestin that's in it. Uh, both of the things use third generation progestins, which there have been studies now for about 10 years saying that third generation progestins have slightly higher blood clotting rates than older progestins. Um, two, from your, two studies from Europe last summer sort of backing up, again, what's now an increasing body of research on that subject. So what the cause is remains to be seen. But it, I guess, goes to is another sort of chapter in that story of saying this new thing that has unique advantages, but we're still kind of finding out what the problems are. Um, and of course, we saw the same thing with Devo Provera and bone loss, even something that had been on the market a long time, where it, there was still this relatively unanticipated consequence with it of, of young women losing bone that was not necessarily regained, although that point is controversial. Some doctors think that it is readily regained. So when it comes to non-hormonal contraception, um, <laughs> There's not a lot. Um, the diet, well, actually, there are two different stories, I guess is the better way to put it. When it comes to female barriers, they're disappearing. So something like the diaphragm, something like the cervical cap, and even something like the female condom, which is a slightly different story. Um, I asked the question in the book, why has the diaphragm disappeared? Um, certainly, the diaphragm has a lower efficacy than hormonal birth control, which is a fact. Um, that, that is not in dispute. Uh, but I think that the story of its disappearance is more complicated than that. Um, I think in part, of course, it has been unfavorably compared with pharmaceutical alternatives trying to position themselves from a marketing standpoint as something young, hip, cool, you know, this is the new. And they position themselves against something like a diaphragm saying, oh, this is 1950s, this is old, this is messy, this is not sex positive, all of these sorts of things. Um, 
I think that it's important because while most women in the United States, ne the majority of women never use something like a diaphragm in the United States, even before the pill, it was never the majority of women, but there was always a group of women that it worked well for. And I think with all of these contraceptives, you find that, that there's a group of women that it works well for. And what happens when they fall out of use for multiple reasons is what's happened with the cervical cap, which is no longer available in the traditional form that your doctor would fit, is available with something called the FemCap, which is a pre-fit device. Comes in three sizes, but just think about how different all women are physically in shape and size and everything, and you can see why a pre-fit device might not have the same kind of efficacy as something that was fit in a more precise way. Um, so I think that's the importance of keeping these things around so that for the women that they're the best option, they're available, and they're available in the best way. Um, the female condom has been redesigned recently. Um, <laughs> Uh, when I spoke to women, I did not get tremendously great feedback about the female condom, but hopefully maybe that will change with this new redesign. It's become sleeker. Uh, it's a different material. It's now made with a synthetic rubber, which conducts heat better and should have a more natural feel than the polyurethane that the older one was made out of. So that's a hopeful story. We'll see what happens. Um, it's one of those things that's always been more in the media than it's been in most women's lives. Um, and the question, I think, for a lot of women's, uh, a women's health activists who see this as something with so many different kinds of benefits is to say, how do you change the perception of it or change the design of the thing so that it's actually better? Um, as diaphragms and, and female barriers are on the decline, the IUD is a star on the rise right now. Um, right now, the major, the big public health organizations, the Guttmach Institute, Planned Parenthood, some of these big organizations are really saying, let's look again at IUDs. And a lot of people are asking, why don't American women choose the IUD? And um, I think there's one answer to that question. I think the answer is the Delcon Shield, um, which was a very popular IUD in the 1970s. Um, in the 1970s, FDA, at that point, lacked the ability to regulate devices. So if I had the, the right you know, manufacturing resources, I could make an IUD. You could make an IUD. It was the Wild West. One IUD that was made was the shield. Um, it was made by a doctor in part by a doctor named Hugh Davis. Dr. Davis concealed his uh, involvement in creating the shield and he concealed his financial interest in it. What he did was he went around sort of uh, raising a, uh, awareness of the dangers of the pill and saying, if you don't like this, try this. And the Dalcon Shield became a real cautionary tale of the dangers of saying, this method is terrible, everything else must be better, let's switch. Um, clearly, the Dalcon Shield was not better. And many women found that out the hard way through um, infection, infertility, and some women even died. Um, today, it's a different story. FDA, as I said, now does regulate these things. Um, there, we say IUDs, but really, in America, we have one IUD. We have Paragard. Um, Morena, which is another type of, it, it's more accurately an, an inner uterine system because it has a hormonal component. So it's a hybrid device. Um, the jury is still out on Paragard. On the one hand, uh, I, I've spoken to women who've had both kinds of experiences. And on the one hand, people are very cautiously optimistic, saying this is a really good thing. This is a great option for women, even young women. For many years, doctors wouldn't put, put IUDs in young women because of the legacy of the Dalcon Shield. Um, but you also have some cautious voices. Uh, Cindy Pearson at the National Women's Health Network said to me, you know, we, we want to withhold judgment because we still think there's a slight increased risk of infection with, with this. So um, I think time and many more women using the device will, will give us these answers. It would be nice if it didn't have to be that way. But um, we'll see what happens. <laughs> sterilization, um, a strange thing to realize about sterilization actually is that you, if you combine male and female, it's the number one method of birth control in the United States. Um, if you don't combine male and female, it's the pill. Um, but I think we don't think of it that way because we think of it as something that's the choice of couples who've completed their families, whatever that means. Um, so I think you know that's changing slightly these days with more couples opting to live child free and making choices like that. And there have been innovations uh, within sterilization, something like Escher, which is a different, uh, an alternative to tubal ligation. And, um, Again, with anything new, uh, we'll have to wait and see on the safety. We won't have uh, the answers, but there is innovation going on. Um, I wrote a chapter in the book on fertility awareness method. I hadn't really heard anything about fertility awareness method before I wrote this book. Um, I, almost as an afterthought, I said, let me look into it, and if it's something, I'll do a chapter. Um, I didn't realize that this was going to be one of the most controversial parts of the book to discuss this. Um, 
Fertility awareness is a type of, of quote unquote natural birth control. I don't like to use the word natural because I think it's more confusing than instructive, but what I mean is that it doesn't involve a device or a pill. Um, so fertility awareness um, involves monitoring the signs within the body, things like um, body temperature throughout the menstrual cycle, cervical fluids, uh, cervical position, things like this, um, charting them and uh, trying to, uh, to figure out when the body ovulates. And you can use this in a number of ways. You, well, if you're trying to figure out when you ovulate, you're using it for probably for pregnancy prevention or for um, pregnancy, you know, for conception, um, which actually more women do. Um, it has, of course, other benefits, and not the least of which is that it gives women a really interesting way to learn about their menstrual cycles and, in fact, their menstrual health and to troubleshoot for, for various kinds of gynecological problems. And it becomes a real resource for that. Even if, you know, like me, you look at it and you say, I'm not ready to use this for birth control. <laughs> but I think the thing that impressed me the most about this is that there's a really passionate feminist community that wants to raise awareness about, about this methodology, which for a lot of years, women's health people have been really cautious of, in part because it, it seems, along with other types of natural birth control, like, like calendar-based methods, something like the rhythm method, to be the province of people who are interested in foreclosing other kinds of contraceptive access. So I think that's one of the big reasons why it's been really hard for, for feminists and women's health people to get up and say, let's talk about this. I don't want to romanticize this. This has really high user failure as a contraceptive method. Um, I spoke to a lot of people who had unplanned pregnancies. I've spoken to people who are happy and who have not. I've, I've heard both stories. Um, I don't think it's so dangerous, though, that we can't talk about it if, if we don't romanticize it. I think we can have a conversation. And in fact, I think it's important because I don't know that we can alliance build with the people who have the knowledge about training in this method right now. So I think it's really important to build a secular feminist base of knowledge about this so that we can provide this information and this training to women who want to use this. Um, I talk a lot about menstruation in this book because I think menstruation is where a lot of women's sort of bad attitudes about various parts of their bodies get going. We are getting messages about our periods when we are so young. Um, an interesting case study in the way that this has worked um, has been the rise of, of menstrual suppression drugs, so hormonal birth control designed to uh, prevent withdrawal bleeding. Most, uh, most traditional birth control pills have uh, several weeks of hormones followed by a week of sugar pills or just not taking any pills. When the hormones that your body's been taking suddenly are withdrawn, you have a, a bleed. Um, that was really the brainchild of John Rock, one of the other men besides Pincus who built the pill. And he was a devout Catholic, and he really believed that he could construct the pill in a way that would, would be acceptable to the Catholic Church, that would seem natural enough, that the Catholic Church could accept it. And he realized that if women weren't having periods, there was nothing that seemed natural about it uh, to the church, for the church. Um, and since then, a lot of people, you know, women for many years have, have skipped periods by simply continuously taking the hormones rather than taking the sugar pills. In the past 10 years, we've seen a number of dedicated drugs come on the market. Uh, the most widely known, I think, uh, uh, there's uh, Seasonal and Seasonique, where you have four periods a year, um, and Librel, which seeks to eliminate periods entirely. Um, these drugs have a lot of potential to help certain groups of women. Uh, women, for example, with certain gynecological problems, with something like endometriosis that makes men that makes menstruation excessively painful. Women who just have really bad periods, you know, uh, there are a lot of women who could benefit from this drug. The problem, there are a lot of problems though, but among them are that these drugs have been sold uh, using some of the worst messages about menstruation. Uh, in particular, and women's bodies in general. And that's really unfortunate because, again, I think these are things that could be really useful. Um, there are two conflicting messages with the menstrual suppression drugs. One is that periods aren't natural, that, uh, that cave women you know, would have been constantly gestating and lactating, so they wouldn't have had regular menstruation, and periods are a product of like sort of a, a lazy post-industrial society and that sort of thing. Um, anytime I see cave women, I get worried. I don't think she ever comes out for good reasons. I don't think it's ever to encourage women to like have more choices in the world. Um, the other message about these drugs, and you can decide for yourself if you think these two messages can be reconciled, is that, um, is that they are a triumph of science that now allows us to go beyond our natural bodies, that all of these messy human things can be overcome because of this fantastic new product. 
I think that it's really interesting in terms of identifying the way that contraception, especially uh, hormonal contraceptives and certain contraceptive devices, are being repositioned as lifestyle drugs by drug makers. So when you watch these ads, these young women are hip, they're cool, they have Lower East Side apartments and indie rocker boyfriends, the coolest new iPhone, and they have X pill. And in this context, the pill becomes divorced from what it does and becomes another consumable. Um, but I think that it's, it's something that you see particularly with menstrual suppression drugs, but more generally with other types of birth control. Um, this becomes a place where you need to separate, uh, you know, health effects from ideology and marketing, and it, it's not always easy. Uh, in general, I don't think that there are negative health effects with these drugs beyond what you see at the regular pill, although of course there are questions that won't be answered for a while. Um, the biggest thing seems to be unscheduled bleeding, ironically, which is that um, when women take these drugs, rather than having a planned withdrawal bleed, they have intermittent bleeding that they don't know when it will come. This is something that decreases with use over time, uh, but doesn't go away for a lot of women, so it's something to take into account. Um, emergency contraception has now been over the counter for several years. Um, this was not assured. This was a long, long fight. Uh, 1998 was the first time that a dedicated emergency contraception pill came on the market. This is a type of birth control that can be taken after sex. Um, 2003, the maker of Plan B, which is the, the most well-known dedicated emergency contraceptive, went to FDA and said, we want to take our product over the counter. Um, the science was there. All the scientists said, the moment is here, let's do it. You know, we've looked at this, this isn't going to endanger women. Increasing access is going to be a help in terms of, for example, maybe helping to lower rates of teen pregnancy, things like that. Um, everyone thought this was a done deal, and then it didn't happen. Then they got an unapprovable letter. It became very clear with a couple more years that politics was trumping science at FDA and that people within the Bush administration were bringing pressure to bear in certain ways to prevent this from happening. Uh, Susan Wood, who was a tremendous women's health activist at FDA for many years, um, watched this happen and eventually ended up walking out on her job as a way to underscore the institutional problems uh, that were allowing politics to beat science. Finally, in 2006, it was approved, but only for women 18 and up, uh, something that changed with a New York court decision a couple years later. Um, the whole incident, though, became the latest chapter in uh, what has become an increasingly successful uh, battle to curtail contraceptive access. Um, I think it was also uh, emergency contraception becomes instructive in other ways, and that I think you see certain con conservative groups using the drug to redefine, in fact, when a pregnancy occurs. Um, you know, if the old the old fight over uh, reproductive choice was that you know, well, is it a life or not? This was a, a, an effort to say, well, let's redefine when pregnancy happens. Um, most scientific def definitions of pregnancy hold that a pregnancy begins when a fertilized egg implants in the uterus and body makes pregnancy hormones. Uh, increasingly, you saw people using EC, which was mentally a great vehicle for this, because of course you take it after sex. And we live with this idea that, you know, you live with the consequences of sex. You can't have unprotected sex and the next day say, all right, you know what, I, didn't, I don't want to get pregnant. Let me take something. So we have something psychologically that says, after sex, abortifacient, before sex, birth control. EC is, in fact, contraception, meaning it's something that works before a pregnancy occurs. It's, in fact, progestin, whereas medication abortion um, is antiprogestin. So, in fact, they're, they're opposite things, in a way. Um, but because of the fact that it's taken after sex, it was a very powerful way to say, no, this is an abortifacient. And then to tie the notion of an abortifacient to a drug that could prevent, um, that changes the uterine envi environment in a way that makes it less hospitable to implantation. If we follow that line of logic and we say that anything that works that way is an abortifacient, that includes the pill, that includes IUDs, that includes breastfeeding. <laughs> this includes a lot of things. Um, so I think this is a really dangerous, slippery slope that we see emerging right now in this conversation. Um, so uh, another question that EC brought up for me was the question of if the regular pill should now come over the counter. We've had a few years of experience, and it's let us think about the, the particular safety and health risks. Obviously, taking the pill is more complicated. You do it consistently over years. Um, obviously, I'm somebody um, who believes that 
you know, safety concerns with the pill are something we should be honest about. Um, I also believe that it should come over the counter because I think in this case, access has become the, the issue that trumps. Uh, studies show, in fact, that women do as well or better than their doctors when given uh, self-screening, stuff to self-screen with for potential problems. And um, I just think, you know, again, this is a very complicated question, but maybe the moment has come. Um, What's, what's difficult, there are a few different things. There was actually just an editorial in the New York Times about this, someone arguing that it's time for it to happen. What's difficult is that so many pills are Me Too drugs. That means they used approval studies from older drugs. So if one of them goes over the counter, all the drugs that use those studies have to go as well. So this becomes a problem if women want to get the pill covered by their insurance. Once it's over the counter, you got to pay for it, and that could be really expensive. One option is to bring progestin-only pills over the counter and leave combined pills on, on prescription. This is, this is not simple either because, of course, it, it has the potential to class the drug because it's a newer, pops are newer, we have less safety data, and the women who needed to rely on over-the-counter access, for example, maybe teenagers, um, would be dealing with a drug that we had less safety information about. But I think at the very least, uh, the discussion about EC opens up these questions. And keep your eye on emergency contraception because, of course, there's a new emergency contraceptive that just got approved. It's going to be even more controversial than Plan B because um, in terms of it might change the uterine environment even more than, than the traditional drugs. We don't know. We're still getting some of these answers, but it's going to be very controversial, so look out for it. Um, the male pill is always five to ten years away. Um, at any given moment, I am used now used to going to parties and having people come up to me and say, oh, isn't this great? I heard on the news it's finally happening, and I don't want to be the person who sort of says, well, maybe not. Um, Gregory Pincus, when he was making the original pill, he dreamed of a male pill as well. And in a day when ethical, uh, ethical standards and trials were lower, he tested an early version of his birth control pill on male mental patients in Massachusetts. Um, so there was always this hope that it could work for men too. Why it hasn't happened is a very complicated question, and there are a lot of answers. Some of the problems have been um, scientific, that we don't have the same catalog, catalog of steroids. Um, so it's harder to find, for example, um, a hormone that would last in the body that could be used in an implant form. So when they test a lot of the hormonal alternatives today, you have men going in once a week or twice a week to receive injections, which is not obviously sustainable in like a real world context. Some of the problems are structural. The drug companies have not been interested in getting involved for many reasons. Obviously, lawsuits are always on the list, but also the perception that men wouldn't use these drugs, uh, that men aren't interested in them, and that women wouldn't trust them to use it. Uh, I've heard these opinions voiced a lot since I've been on tour with this book, but I believe we have to overcome these kind of ideas if we're ever going to get a product made. Um, obviously, when we do, it's going to have health and safety problems as well, and I don't, I, you know, Women live with that, and I don't wish it on men, but I still think um, it's something where I would like to see men, in one way or another, more involved with, with this decision-making process and this conversation. Um, part of the problem, like I said, has been, uh, <laughs> so, so without drug company money, it's very hard to bring a drug all the way through trials. What's happened is that the World Health Organization has done a lot of the research, and, and big international um, health organizations have done a lot of the research. This has become uh, both a good thing and a bad thing. It's, it's had some real uh, innovation in terms of how you can um, do perform studies novelly all over the world with different labs. And it's had some problems. For example, one method that was tested in China and had um, a 98% efficacy and then was tested on, on Caucasian men in Scotland, and the efficacy dropped to about 65%. So there's huge ethnic variation and racial variation with some of these drugs. And an international organization doing the testing obviously then faces unique challenges in terms of moving these things along. Um, so yeah, um, that's the things that are closest to happening are hormonal alternatives. Non-hormonal things are further away. In the 1980s, uh, it hit the news that there was finally it was going to happen. This, the, there was a drug called Gossipol that was being developed in China, and it was going to be a non-hormonal male contraceptive option. Gossipol came from the cotton plant. Um, it, they noticed in certain rural regions of China that in times of famine, uh, people would eat a cotton byproduct and that the men would start to be sterile. They explored this further and they found that the cotton plant has this nifty self-defense mechanism that it causes sterility in anything that eats it. Um, 
So for a moment, it looked like it was going to happen. As it turned out, gossipol was not reversible. So it was, in fact, a type of sterilization, not a type of reversible contraception. And this story has replayed itself over the years with a couple of different non-hormonal botanicals. Um, I think with non-hormonal male birth control, though, you see people thinking really so far outside the box. And I think there's something valuable about that process anyway. Sort of thinking, where can we come into the reproductive cycle to stop? So for example, should we, can we create something that causes the tails on the sperm not to work? Or you know, in different ways, um, these things are really far away. They're science fiction still. But what it shows is the type of creativity that we've become very accustomed to not having for a lot of different reasons. Um, finally, I wrote a chapter uh, on environmental effects of contraception. I thought it was important to do it because it seems like an issue that's really coming up. Um, I want to say from the beginning that when we talk about, for example, finding ethanol estradiol in water or in the environment in different ways, it is not alone. It is alongside massive amounts of agricultural estrogens, uh, industrial estrogens, like chemicals that are used to harden and soften plastic, um, phytoestrogens, endocrine disruptors from beauty products. We're sort of in a chemical soup. The pill is a piece of this puzzle, but you can't single women and the pill out. So it becomes something where I think on the one hand, I just I received an email two weeks ago that the American Life League is mounting a protest about, you know, arguing that the pill kills the environment. Once again, women are singled out and the pill is singled out. And this is just not this is neither accurate nor just. On the other hand, I think we need to be in conversation about these issues and about the role, you know, that the pill does play in this problem. Um, and what we can do, of course, again, like I said with the trials earlier, is we can start to do proactive things that don't involve women giving up the pill. For example, developing better water filtration, things like that, you know, thinking creatively. Also, of course, uh, condoms, which, you know, until we find another way to, to prevent sexually transmitted infection, I think, you know, condoms have increasing, only increasing relevance in our lives. Um, and that's the way it should be. But I think, I wish that we had better ways to dispose of them that were more environmentally friendly. And I think that's a conversation that we can have about better ways to do that. So I'll finish up now and take some questions, but thank you so much. I said, um, I would say a couple of things. Obviously, it's, it's uh, incredibly popular, like I said, uh, male and female sterilization being at the top of the list for Americans still in terms of their contraceptive options. There are, is still innovation in terms of creating better procedures. I heard about one the other day. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's out there. <laughs> I guess what I would say is that for many years, I, during the writing of this book, I spoke to a lot of couples. I spoke to a lot of young men who had chosen to have vasectomies who didn't want children and who had really struggled to find doctors who would perform them. Um, and obviously, I think that's really wrong. I understand why doctors are reluctant to do it, but I think, again, at the end of the day, nobody else should be making your contraceptive decisions for you. And if that's the right method for you, then you know you shouldn't have doctors saying, "Oh, come back to me in 30 years." You know, you don't know what you want. So, so I mean, I I think we're on the same page for sure. Um, it seems really strange to me. I, I to be in the position of answering this question because I think I've been I've been sort of um, criticized for being too critical of the pill throughout the process of bringing this book along, um, and I what I want to be is honest about it to say I mean I think first of all, a lot of people feel it's dangerous. A lot of people think it's like a huge health benefit and a, and a boon. I think the answer is somewhere in the middle. I think some women have really bad experiences with the pill. We know this, and like I said, my friend was one of them who had a stroke. Um, these things are still out there. But a lot of women do well. Um, I think there will always be health questions with the pill because of the types of research that we can do on it. What we can't do is like a WHI style, massive, long term, randomized, double blinded clinical trial for a lot of obvious reasons. You can't placebo control big pill trials. Um, there's people who do little ones, and they, they have all the women use other methods of contraception. But obviously, you know. You can't ask thousands and thousands of women to stay on the birth control pill for 15 years of their life or 20 years of their life in the way that they did with hormone therapy uh, with the Women's Health Initiative. So I think there are some things that are going to stay open questions. I think also there are questions that we're not asking, for example, about the benefits of the menstrual cycle and about things that get shut down um, when you take the pill. Um, I think these are questions worth asking, and I try to hit on that in the book. And a lot of the stuff you're talking about in terms of female bodies and medicalizing female bodies, I touch on in the menstruation chapter in that portion of the book because I absolutely think you're right. Um, and it's something that we can't come to this discussion without acknowledging 
the history of and, and thinking of the ways that we still live with those challenges, for sure. Not hormonal birth control. That was definitely something I saw that while some women go back to the pill, many do not. I mean, obviously many do. But I also saw higher incidents, for example, of IUD use, um, things that were somehow a middle ground between sterilization and totally reversible birth control. Um, yeah, I, although in some contexts, for example, like right after childbirth, there are certain methods that are better at that time. Like I think progestin-only pills, birth control pills have been used, although there's some questions about that with safety. So. Yeah, Mirena is an IUD, so in some ways it works using the, the, in the ways that IUDs do, which I should say from the beginning, we're not entirely sure how they work. Um, it has something to do with causing a low level of inflammation that um, makes it unlikely that you'll have a pregnancy. Um, with Mirena, you add to that progestin that's released slowly in the body over time and lessens how much is released over time. Um, but it's something that, because of that, is maybe closer to something like Norplan or JDEL or Implanon. It, it's more like a, a contraceptive insert than, than um, even something like Depo, which is a shot that obviously takes time to wear off, but it doesn't last for 10 years, like Mirena. Or, or no, Mirena's shorter, for five years, like Mirena. I think, I mean, I, I don't know specifically that I'm uh, not being from the area, but what I'll say is that, uh, um, I, I feel very strongly about uh, providing contraceptive education to children. Like I think it's been a real, a really damaging thing. Um, when you look at the United States and you say why are teen pregnancy rates so high, part of that is material access, is actually having the devices, but part of it also is educational and it's making sure that people have information so they can make choices. And that's not something that in this country has been an easy thing and will not be. I think most studies show, too, I just want to add, most studies show that um, people who are provided with really good comprehensive sexual education are less likely to have problems. It doesn't encourage more sexual activity, as is always sort of the line on it. That, that's been shown in most of the studies to be inaccurate. Um, so, Well, it's one of those things. I think when, for example, my mentor Barbara Seaman was thinking about the advent of this, she thought, what a great thing. People can make their own decisions. They'll put it out there. One of the things she wanted with the original pill was a patient packet insert, which at that time there was none. Your doctor would give you a packet of pills and say, take these, and that was it. That was the end of your questions. You weren't like, well, should I expect you know, my skin to get better or my hair to fall out or whatever. You didn't ask those kind of questions. Um, so I think she thought, oh, this will be great. Now, now all that information will be there on the television. I think we've all seen that it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, you have, you know, things where it's like, may it cause, you know, bleeding, sterility, incontinence, you know. But then on the other hand, it makes it look really sexy. So it's complicated. <laughs> Um, I don't think there's an easy answer. Um, I'm not really for banning it, but I think, I mean, for me, I don't know, when you hear this sort of laundry list of side effects, I think, for me, the bigger problems, and this was something I dealt with much more in my first book, come in with the relationships between drug companies, medical journals, and doctors. Because I think in a lot of cases, the, the bigger th decision-making factor for people becomes, what does my doctor say, or what did, you know, what did the media, what did my local news station say, which of course has everything to do with what the journal said and they take their stories from there. So I think that's a piece of it too, um, making sure that, that doctors aren't salesmen for drugs. All right, thank you. And thank you all so much for coming out.